Welcome to Data Science Perspectives. This series focuses on analytics and data science professionals from across industry to learn about how their career unfolded, what skills they look for when hiring, and what trends they think are coming next. I'm your host, Bill Franks. Let's get to it. Welcome to this episode of Data Science Perspectives. I'm your host, Bill Franks. Today, we're going to be joined by Erica McBride, the Group Vice President of Data and Analytics at Tenarity. I first met Erica probably six or seven years ago when she was still with Dow up in northern Michigan. I still remember my first visit there, which happened to be in the spring when the weather was great, but I could tell it would be very chilly in the winter. As with many of the executives that I've featured on the show, I think you're going to find Erica to have a very unique and interesting background. She began her career with Paychex, a company many of us actually get our paychecks through, uh, where she held several roles focused on analytics within their risk management uh, function. She then moved to Dow Chemical Company, where she had both director and senior director level roles within the analytics organization. Over time, she helped Dow implement a variety of pricing and cross-sell models. She supported a range of operational activities with analytics, and she helped Dow implement and update their analytics strategy. More recently, she moved to be Group Vice President of Data Analytics at Tenarity, and in that role, she's helping them begin to advance their analytics capabilities. Alongside her day jobs over recent years, she's also spent a decade as an adjunct professor at St. John Fisher University in Rochester, New York, where she's taught courses to both master's and PhD students. She herself has a bachelor's in accounting from the State University of New York, Geneseo, She has an MBA from Rochester Institute of Technology, and she has an educational doctorate in executive leadership from St. John Fisher. And with that, let's welcome Erica to the show. Hey, Erica, thanks for joining me on the show today. Well, thanks for having me, Bill. Glad to be here. So I always like to start with a a generic question about how people got into the world of data science and analytics, and everyone seems to have their own unique story. So, so back when you were going through and then coming out of school, what, what kind of drew you into this world? Well, I say it's brilliant strategy on my part because it's such a great place to be. I'm actually a CPA by training, uh, but at Paychex, I was leading the management information systems group. So that's the group that's the, the, the data people. And we had a new director come in from a banking background where credit modeling has been done for a really long time. And he said he had an idea to do modeling at, at Paychex as well for the most important risks for the organization, which is client retention risk. So he brought in a data scientist and they started working with uh, Bear Isaac, you know, the FICO score people uh, to develop the first uh, Paychex attrition model to help us retain our small business customers. When they wanted to move on to the next model the director said, well, we should probably pull the group together, the MIS team and the data science team. And that data scientist wasn't an experienced people leader. I was, so I recommended it all roll up to me. And um, voila, here we are about uh, you know a dozen years later and with a lot of analytics under my belt. That's really interesting. So basically then you just happened to, to be there doing a different type of role when analytics hit the company for the first time. And to your point, smart planning, you, you jumped at the opportunity to get involved with analytics, which I'm sure has served you well over the time since. Very, very true. It's, and it's always, you know, an opportunity to learn and grow because uh, it's uh, moving very quickly. So I'm just curious, you, you gave a little bit of the hint of the genesis of the group over time when you were at, at Paychex. What, what kind of general analytics did you, did you end up doing? And were there any early lessons you got then having been trained more formally as a CPA that you kind of had some aha moments about how analytics works generically in in the business world uh, when you actually start using real data? Well, at Paychex, analytics was part of the risk management organization. Even today, as you know, analytics isn't always in the the IT function. About half the time it's there, you know, the rest of the time it could be in strategy, it could be in uh, marketing, could be in risk. Um, but there, there it was uh, all about risk management and um, retention risk was one of the biggest risks that we had to the company. But then we started building models that are about other kinds of credit risk, credit uh, and cross-selling, upselling risk, uh, various other employee turnover risks. So that way we were building models that controlled risks all over the company. 
uh, after a couple of years, you know, we had about 20 models deployed and they were all adding value to, to the bottom line. Um, and, and, and as part of that function, you, you can learn a lot about the organization. And I learned to really listen to the business challenge. And given my financial training, I know what KPIs mean, how they talk about their balance sheets and whatnot. I can listen for the business challenge and then identify those opportunities where analytics can provide a good solution, translate that to the analytics team, and then translate the analytics capabilities back to the business really well by being that translator. That's uh, one of the niche skills that I that I bring to this role and those lessons that I've learned is really important. You, you, you know, you mentioned the translator role. That's something that I don't think formally existed or was discussed until just recent times, but uh, I've found that many of the people I know who ended up in early uh, leadership roles in analytics inherently were doing that and or had people on their team doing that for them, even though it wasn't recognized. So was that was that something that you intentionally pursued? You saw an opportunity to be a translator or is just something that in your role you sort of just did it organically and then realized on the back end that it, it was a, a great skill to have? Yeah, I naturally was part of that because I had all the business acumen to be able to do that. And then as I learned more about analytics, I realized that that was a key role within an analytics organization. You need the, the, the strong data people, you need the data scientists, and you need those folks to be the translator. So you went for paychecks, you ended up in, and I first met you, I guess, when you were at Dow, of, of course, which you know, uh, more of a, a technology company doing a lot of B2B, you move over to a huge global industrial organization. Um, I imagine there were some big differences in terms of what you found, both the, the data sets that they had, the analytics that they required, and just the, the culture there. So what, what was that like uh, when you moved over to, to Dow? Yeah, a very different, as you can imagine. So Paychex had, I think, 15,000 employees, but Dow had 50,000 at that time, and Dow was 120 years old and had scientists, you know, all over the company. Uh, but there was pockets of data science happening when I joined Dow in uh, like supply chain, doing route optimization, uh, manufacturing was doing predictive maintenance type projects, uh, R and D was doing uh, design of experiment type projects, and I was leading the analytics team that was a little bit more centralized under IT that would build the models that. Uh, those other teams weren't weren't answering. So those other areas of the company. Um, in the first year I was there, I started kind of building a network of all of these um, analytics and data science teams, a community of practice, so to speak. And uh, it quickly grew to about 400 people where we would do once a month, we'd do technical sharing sessions where folks would kind of showcase one of their projects. Those were really well attended. And then every year, once or twice, we do like poster sessions where we'd have several dozen data scientists kind of showcasing their posters and business leaders would come and hear about the state of analytics. And then we did a data science challenge kind of shark tank uh, things that we did every couple of years where the business leaders would identify a business challenge, throw it out there to the data science community who they bring we bring teams of folks together to come pitch an idea in front of the sharks and the, the winning idea would get funded to, to be developed and deployed and the winning team would get some dollars there too. So it was, it was just a great community of practice. And then by bringing all of those data scientists together, that paved the way for the federated org model that is now part of the uh, AI strategy at Dow. I love the idea that you put out there, you know, they did the sharing of uh, literal sort of internal conference poster sharings and then the, the Shark Tank. Uh, one thing I know and, and I've talked to you about in the past and you've heard other analytics execs talk about is having to build kind of that internal awareness as well as credibility and doing uh, doing things like that. I'm assuming you found that those were immensely beneficial other than just motivating and getting your team something kind of exciting and different to participate in that that's where your business partners and sponsors were really able to get to know the team and then you know see the the, the side of uh, they had that would be able to benefit them yeah and i think you know the the appreciation for analytics and what data can do has been on the upswing for a long time and i think 
kind of reach the tipping point through the different outreach that we would do and how we would engage the leaders through these, these different ways. So I think it was you know, a win-win for everyone. Well, so more recently, I guess during COVID even, you moved uh, uh, over to uh, Tenerity. And I know folks would uh, watching probably, everyone would probably know of Paychex. Everyone probably knows of Dow. Tell us just a little bit about Tenerity and, and what it does and, and what you're up to over there. Yeah. This is another big cultural shift coming over to Tenerity. So Tenerity is a customer loyalty company where we work with our clients to help them spark their customer loyalty. So one of the big ways we do that is by working with merchants to gather various um, offers, like you can give $5 cash back if you go shop at this store or you know $10 off this, this sort of product, this other place. And uh, we have thousands of offers in the portfolio but um, so let's let's say we, we have a number of financial services clients and you, Bill, are a uh, member of that that bank. And because you're a member of that bank, you get access to all of this wealth of, of offers that we have. However, we've built the analytics to figure out what are the very best offers to put in front of Bill to keep Bill engaged and excited to continue to work with that bank and and sparking sparking loyalty. So Tenerity kind of spun up, spun out from another organization in 2021 so it's a bit of a startup mode um small but mighty team a couple of data scientists that are doing these really strategic projects and embedding analytics in our products Andrew, so you started in more of a, a b2b kind of space went to like industrial manufacturing now it sounds like you're more of a b2c space you're actually these offers i'm assuming sound like they're to consumers like us not to companies correct interesting so Having now seen those three, you know, different environments and the way that analytics are done and some of the, um, you know, the strategies that do and don't work with both the data side, the analytics side, are there any uh, kind of common threads uh, that you could uh, put forth as a couple of tips for folks that you, you found seems to work somewhat universally? Uh, the main thing that I would say is uh, to understand kind of where the organization is. Where are they in there? As we mentioned, kind of their understanding and appreciation of what analytics can do. So it's really important to meet any of the leaders kind of where they are. So if you have a leader who said, hey, I just read this thing, saw this post about AI and I really need some AI, what can you do for me? Um, a mistake that I see people make sometimes is uh, they'll try to say, well, you know, what you're talking about isn't really AI, but that's, that's a more descriptive analytic thing. AI is more about this, you know, machine learning thing over here. But like, I think that's a big mistake because you kind of deflate their excitement. What I do is I rather come in and say, you know what, I'm really excited about AI and what it can do also. So let's really talk about your business challenge. And then we will figure out what is the right analytic solution to, to solve that business challenge. So I think it's important to recognize wherever you are, just kind of meet, meet the leaders and embrace their excitement. And then we'll all learn from each other as we develop the, the models. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I literally had a, a blog uh, probably three years ago that was exactly on that topic. And it was based on a conversation I had with another analytic exec who had uh, said the same thing to me, but the opposite. He was complaining to me about how all these business people keep coming to me, wanting me to do AI, and I have to keep explaining to them why AI doesn't fit. And I just say, I said, I think you're making a big mistake. And he said, why? I said, you've got them excited to work with your team. You've got them bringing you a problem. You know you can solve the problem. You've been wanting to have this uh, flow of, of things coming your way, but you're throwing cold water on them and, and, and possibly offending them or, or making them feel stupid or otherwise, you know, just not helping them. And they may not come back again. I was like, yeah, just take the problem, say you'll solve it. And if you don't use AI, they're not going to care. <laughs> right. of, you know? exactly. But if you make them happy, they're, they're definitely going to care. So I think that's, yeah, that's a, that's a huge point. I always say if, if, if someone doesn't misunderstand something to a degree that will fundamentally cause an issue like making a bad decision or otherwise doing something really wrong. If they temporarily are a little over enthusiastic, just let it go. You can eventually, you know, you can eventually rein them in, but last thing, yeah, you don't want to pour that cold water. Very wise. Bill. So as you look across, you know, the years you've been working across uh, at these different companies, what do you think are the one or two skills or traits you have that have most enabled you to, you know, succeed and then grow into in increasingly responsible roles over time? 
I would say it's probably because I'm a lifelong learner. As we mentioned before, this field is moving so quickly, changing so fast. You always have to be reading and you know, talking to folks, figuring out what people have found as be a better way to do things. What can you adapt from industry one and bring it over to yours? They say, you know, the smartest person is the one who realizes all the stuff that they don't know. I think there's no more important quality in the field of analytics than to always be excited about learning and growing your understanding. I think that's a good thing. I, I, re I remember the, the uh, I forget the old line, it's knowing, knowing what you don't know and admitting what you don't know is just mm -hmm. as important as knowing what you know or something along those lines. And, and yeah, it is interesting because the reality, especially the way data science has evolved in recent years with so many more algorithms and types of data and so forth, the reality is I don't believe anybody can really know in depth all of data science anymore. It's just too broad. And anyone who thinks they do is going to, you know, they're, they're kind of fooling themselves and they're actually putting their teams at risk because there's going to be things that come up that they're going to have to rely on on their team members or teammates to know because you're just not going to know everything. So how, how do you deal with that? Like in, in your, uh, within your team, how do you encourage that, that sharing across and, and knowing, getting to know who knows what and where they can best fit? Well, we always say we got to use our diversity to our advantage, right? So we would, it's really important to know your team, understand where everybody's expertise is, and then where there's opportunities to, to broaden expertise. We talk about these T-shaped roles, you know, have a depth in a certain area, and then have the, the cross part of the T be, be the broadening part. So uh, it's really important to understand where your teams are and then give them the, the projects and the, the relationships that, that help to, to broaden their roles and their understanding. The more you can know, it can only ever, ever help you. So one of the things you've done for many years, even while you've been working, is you've, you've actually been an adjunct professor. So how did you get into doing the adjunct professor um, work and, and what, you know, what excites you about that? And then how did you find time to do that with a day job? Because it yeah. sounds, I think I know so many people who would love to do that, but then get intimidated, even if they had an opportunity about how would I squeeze that in? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I have a doctorate in education, which is a bit of a unicorn thing, but it uh, means that I did my doctoral work within a community of professional educators. So I grew up in schools of business. As I mentioned, I have a financial background which is very much a set and get kind of a, a educational environment, but being in a spot where I could see examples of different teaching styles and pedagogy really uh, opened my eyes to this discipline. And uh, I had a professor who was on my dissertation committee who said that she thought I could develop an MBA course out of my dissertation research. She had me meet with the Dean of the business school and she said she would teach it with me. So of course he, he had to say yes. And um, so, you know, de developed the syllabus. She helped me a bit on it. Um, then she came to the class and she sat in the back and uh, graded other papers while I, while I taught the class. She gave me all the money for the class, even though we're supposed to split it, she gave it all to me. Um, so the fact that she trusted me to do it, uh, kind of gave me the, the freedom to, to go off and, uh, and start this journey as, as a professor. I keep finding time for it because I really enjoy being part of that learning environment. Again, like I said, it's about meeting people where they are and then see how much they grow by the end of the semester is always super rewarding for me. You know, that I think there's a good lesson in there for, for students, which is take the opportunity when you get it. So basically, you had a professor pull you into it when you weren't even looking to do it. And it ends up that you were good at it and enjoyed it and have continued. Exactly. And, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe after I retire, it'll be more of a full-time gig. We'll see. Yeah. You can be like me, working full time at university. Sure. Good plan. So this is a great tie to, to something. So, oh, you know, as you go through a career, different things are of the most interest or excite you most at any point in time. So these days, when you wake up, you look at your, your calendar and agenda for the day and what you're going to be doing. What would be a great day? Like what, what are the things that would be on your calendar that would make you excited to start the day? Um, the most exciting days for me, I'd most like to see a calendar full of one-on-ones with my team. 
you know, including the skip levels, but the, the entry level folks, because I really enjoy getting to know each individual on the team, the, what unique talents they bring and how I can best support and develop their growth. Um, as my teams have gotten bigger over time and I've had more responsibilities, that's been tougher to do. And I had to kind of balance it with doing the strategic decision making for, for my various uh, responsibilities. But I never want to be too far from the folks that are doing doing the work because um, that's where everything happens. I think it was um, Peter Drucker who said uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? So you can have the best strategy, but if you don't have the right environment to implement it, the supportive culture that's needed, it's the strategy is going to go nowhere. So that would be uh, the best day for me, I think, for those one-on-one -on -one days. Honestly, that sounds to me like it overlaps a lot, you, you know, with your, your degree in education, teaching, developing that class, because that, that sounds a little bit like a, a, a big focus on mentoring, teaching, and, and guiding the, the team along in, in their own careers. Yeah, I say that I, uh, I lead the team the way I lead the classroom, right? We're all learning from each other. I'm going to write that one down. I like that quote. <laughs> so speaking of classroom then, for students who might be watching, um, what, what would be one or two pieces of advice you'd give to students if they're thinking about you know, how to best start their career, particularly in uh, an analytics or data science related field? I would say the main thing is to not be afraid to try new things. So as we talked about, I moved from a service organization. I was there for 17 years and I went to chemical manufacturing. Now I'm at kind of a digital startup. You can always take something from all of these prior experiences and build upon it for your next role. So if there's, there's you know, 10 line items on a job description and you're only comfortable with like six of them, just, you know, have confidence in your abilities that you'll, you'll figure out the other four. So don't be afraid to take those chances. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. And, you know, I think there's a distinction and, and, and you hinted at it, but there's there's getting in purely over your head where you know nothing, right? If someone came and wanted to hire me to be a CPA, for example, I don't have any CPA training. That that would be probably a bridge too far. But then there's things where you're just not sure, oh, I haven't done that quite that way, or I'm not, I'm not as familiar with that algorithm where, but it's in your, in your general scope of what you, could learn and probably do know more about than you think. And yeah, if you don't push yourself into those new areas, then you'll end up just stuck in pigeonholed and wherever you start, which some people are happy with that. But I think the, the, the folks I know who have been most successful and happy have done what you said. They, they look for opportunities to try something new and purposely push themselves a little bit out of their comfort zone on, a, on an ongoing basis. Absolutely. And it, it, as I mentioned, it's always about learning and building your knowledge and you'll, you'll take it. Uh, as far as you can. So one thing I always love to close with is a question about, you know, looking ahead, a lot of what we've talked about was, you know, well in the past to maybe the present, as you look ahead next three, five years or so, what do you think some of the biggest trends and patterns that uh, are coming our way in the world of AI, data science and analytics? Well, as we said, there's always a lot going on, right? Especially in like the tech space here. Um, you know, we've moved beyond data lake. Now it's all about data fabric, data mesh, those things, cognitive computing, another big trend and um, development of synthetic data. I think I saw a blog post or something from you recently, Bill, on that one, right? Um, but one of the other trends that's a little bit more on the people side that I'm really keeping my eye on is the development of the citizen data scientist role. You know, it's been growing for the last several years. Um, that's the bridge between kind of a reporting analyst versus a, a critical data scientists. Um, these are folks that are empowered, you know, by out of the box algorithms while they know the organization's data. So I think I read one statistic from Gartner that said that these roles are growing five times as fast as traditional data science roles uh, for the next couple of years. So I'm really interested in seeing how organizations kind of train and support these folks and how to have the right governance structures to, um, enable them while accelerating the analytics outcome topics like you know data ethics responsible use practices i don't know that anyone has fully solved that yet so i'm really interesting to see how that continues to evolve over the next couple of years 
Yeah, I'm with you. I think that's going to be a big trend. And you know, the interesting thing is there are people who are really negative towards that trend and who focus on the risk side of, well, these people don't know what they're doing. They're going to screw things up. I, I land on the side of even to the extent those risks are there, I think the, the movement is uh, happening with too much momentum behind it and we're not going to be able to fight it. So your, your choice is to attempt to guide a citizen data scientist in a safe and effective manner as you enable them, rather than if you try and block them from coming into your organization, I think you're going to lose that, that battle. In fact, I think many people already have. And to your point, it's a matter of figuring out where are the boundaries drawn and how, how do you do it? But the company will be better off if you can get some of the easier stuff, the, the things that a citizen data scientist can do. Why do you want to have a, you know yourself or high, or high powered people on your team doing those things when someone else can? It, it actually frees you up to do more value. And I think that's the part people miss. I think it can be good for everybody when those happen. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I think just bringing those folks together in a community, like I mentioned, is a really good starting point. And then you can you know, provide the right training, support, guidance, and it's it's the, the winning outcomes that we all want. Well, maybe we can have another chat in a year or two, and I can hear how uh, how you've enabled that then uh, at your at your new organization as, uh, as they go down that path. Um, Perfect. I want to thank you for your time today. I think I think you gave some really good food for thought, and, and I definitely appreciate you being on the show. Uh, thank you, Bill. You have a lovely day. You too.